Um, yeah, so um, my name is Alfonso Mack, um, and I'm a pastor in training here. So if you have not met me, nice to meet you. Um, I am thankful to be able to be sharing God's word with you this morning. Um, so just, just a heads up, this morning is going to be a little bit different, um, uh, more devotional in nature. Um, so if anybody knows me, people know I like to preach for a long time. Um, but today won't be anything like that. It'll be a little bit shorter um, as we'll be closing up our series and what matters most. And so th- this morning will be a little bit more contemplative and just, just a time for us to really just think and process what the Lord is doing. And so in, in this series, um, we, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, riches and, and wealth and generosity and what, what has God called us to do with all that we have um, and, and what that looks like. Um, and as we approach this morning, and, and this, this this week has actually been one that's been a lot harder, as I know Matthew was just up here and Kent was talking about it, as, as I would like to say, uh, Matt Party is one of my favorite people. Um, uh, he's kind of like a father to me. Um, and so this uh this this week's been a little bit harder okay and uh as i as i've been like grieving and and crying and and just processing and, and praying and seeking god i've had to come to grips with, with the realities of, of of losing health and, and the realities of what that looks like as we draw near towards the end of our lives um cuz we'll all reach that point um and i've just wondered what what matters most in life what's going to give me life at the end end of the day I had to wrestle with the truth of the gospel this week very heavily in the face of every single pursuit in life, right? And pursuing family, friends, relationships, you know, uh, wanting to, to work hard and, and build legacies um, and, and provide for, for my kids and wealth for my kids. And I noticed that one day I just, I, I won't be here. One, one day I won't be. And everything that, I, that I've sought after, it, it'll come to an end. And it, and it seems like that might be the moment where it's like I might become broken, poor, just like I was when I walked into this earth. Uh, I came into this earth with nothing. And I'll leave this world with nothing. Won't have anything else left. And everything that I've ever tried to gain and work for will be left here. And so as I think about that, and I also think about ending this series on how to be rich and what matters most, I just take this step back and I realize that, that we've become very, very obsessed with wealth in our culture. Right, just wealth and riches. We become very, very fascinated, right, with, with with exotic cars, fancy homes, fancy meals. As I love fancy meals, nice, nice shoes, all all those great things. Um, and those things aren't bad; they're really not. Um, but when we don't obtain them, something happens within us, and we realize we have these desires in our unsatisfied souls that actually come alive, and we realize deep down that that we want those things very badly and think those things would give us life and they would give us meaning. And then when we don't get them, we seem to be a little bit jealous of those who have them. And so I view those things and then I look also into Christian culture and we also have this this reality where we sometimes get uh, obsessed with those who seem spiritually rich, right? Th- th- those who we, we gravitate towards, those great preachers and teachers, the ones who seem like they've overcome the world. They've overcome all battles with sin Some who seem like heroes, we gravitate towards the families and those who seem like they don't have any parenting problems, no real marital problems. They seem to have just figured it out on their own. They seem to have everything that that, that says that they they are rich and what matters most. And where this leaves us as we close this series is really just having to look at at the words of Jesus. And just stare at the barrel of what Jesus has to say. So the words that we'll be hearing from Jesus this morning kind of just flips upside down the spiritually elite and the physically wealthy. As these words, they really, his words really just dismantle self-sufficiency and self-righteousness. They set the record straight for our need for God in all things in our lives, over all things. And that includes riches. And so, so before we get to the verses this morning, I just have just one question just to think about. It's, and it's a very simple question that I've had to think about all week. It just says, is your soul needy for Jesus? Is your soul needy for Jesus? And so if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn to, to, uh, with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Um, and please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Matthew 5, verse 3. It's just one verse. And this is what it says. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is reading God's word. You may be seated.
And so Jesus, he comes with, with these simple uh, but powerful words to kind of reveal something to his audience and even to us today. And it's this, this picture of to be rich in God, you must actually be poor. Now, this is an interesting way for Jesus to actually start his first ever sermon. So right here, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. This is his first time getting up and actually teaching outside of the time he was younger and he was in the temple. So this is, and, it, and so you have to wonder and wrestle, well, why does he start out this way? And, and some of that is because of the significance of our relationship with God and even understanding the gospel and the reason why he came to this earth is why he starts here. And just to let you know that this would have actually been a confusing way to start his first ever sermon to even the Jewish people during this time, as they would have been listening and it would have been very normal for them in their culture to view riches and wealth as a means of, of the chief element of prosperity and what it means to actually have favor from God. And so it would have been really interesting for them to hear this, which sounds about right. Because even if I think about our world today, if the, if the world wrote this verse, it would say, blessed are the rich, because they have everything. Blessed are the rich, because they have everything. But Jesus has something else to teach the people and even us this morning. And so when you begin to actually break down this verse, it will actually help us understand and make sense of what he is actually doing here. And so he says, blessed, to start out, blessed. Okay, this word is, is this picture of happy, but it's not just this circumstantial happy. It's this consistent joy. Um, there's this uneasily shaken kind of bless. And then he says, blessed are what? The poor. And so here's like, what is he referring to the poor? The, the poor are the needy. Those who are in need of assistance, those who have little to, to no material resources, especially those of value. And then he says of spirit, those who are poor in spirit. And so here he's referring to the heart. That is what is deep down within inside a person. It's what makes a person who they are. It's the character of a person, their well-being. It's the thing that drives you. So he says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And essentially, it's really this way. Happy are those whose hearts are desperate and needy for God, for they will receive the kingdom. That's kind of what he's saying here if you just break that down. Happy are those whose heart are desperate and needy for God, for they will receive the kingdom. And this is what he says, but it's like, well, why does Jesus say these words? And I think Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, actually helps the words of Jesus come alive, and rela- come alive to us. And he says this in Isaiah 64, 6, we have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. And so what Jesus is essentially saying is this, is no amount of work, no amount of work makes us wealthy and worthy of us to be in the presence of God. He's essentially saying our sin is this barrier, and we are dirty and poor people when we stand before God. It's like when I would walk, when I would get home, and it's muddy outside, my mom would always say to me, don't, boy, don't you ever, 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 ever walk those nasty shoes, those dirty shoes on my carpet. So I have to take my shoes off before I came in. Why? Because those things will make things dirty. They do not deserve to be in the presence. And here is this picture of it, we, there's a cleansing that is needed. There's this, this need for a savior and another righteousness that is just spotless and blameless. And so this verse shows one's spiritual powerlessness and bankruptcy apart from Christ. And sometimes in our Christianity, we can be, even begin to believe this lie within our hearts that we can work hard enough to obtain this on our own. Or that we already have all that we need. And it's interesting that that can be the the lie that we sometimes believe because it's the same thing that Jesus actually said to one of the churches in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. This is what he says. He says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And this is verse 17. He says, for you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So, he, so this is how it all comes full circle. And so to, step, so to step into really just being rich and what matters most happens when we recognize the other side, and it's the side that we are actually poor before God. And I know that this dichotomy can be really hard to fathom and understand because we've talked about how do we actually use our wealth, our wealth and our resources for God's glory throughout this entire series. But all this is is just this reflection of the upside-down kingdom Being rich in what matters most is just being rich in God, which is just being poor in spirit. 
It's the seeking Jesus above all else and, and just sacrificing and laying down all things in order to obtain that which is eternal. It is a trust and independence upon God alone. Paul Tripp says it this way. He says, we all need bankruptcy. This is the first step of God's work of grace in our lives. In an act of divine mercy, God opens up the well-guarded vault of our righteousness to show us that, contrary to what we thought, it is absolutely empty. We then must face the shocking realization of our complete poverty, that rather than being righteous, we are, in fact, unrighteous in every way. And this drives us to cry out for forgiveness and help. In this way, the magnificent blessings of the kingdom of God are open and available only to the poor. It is admitting that you have nothing that causes you to reach out for the amazing something that is offered to you in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are some powerful words that he has to say about this verse. And, 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 and when you just think about this, it's like our poverty makes it so that we just have nothing to offer before God to save us from sin, which is why we needed Jesus so badly. And I love 2 Corinthians 8 because it helps bring this picture to life. It says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, <laughs> this is so beautiful, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus literally became poor, taking on our sin that has made us dirty. And this is the reality that the scriptures talk about. So the hot po heart posture of poverty, poverty is where we obtain wealth and riches forevermore. And I love this because Jesus, he just steps right into it with us. He is spotless and blameless. He is clean. And this is just an outworking of the gospel. The good news is that he steps into our sin. And he dies in our place as an act of grace. This is what he does. And he became poor just like us, out of humility, because he is God. He's God and he loved us enough. And because he was God, he reigned over it so that we actually might be made rich in him for all of eternity. And he is our example of what it means to be poor in spirit. He is our example. He is the one that we look to. If you even go look at his life, he, he showed it in even the way he sought out his father. Jesus is our example. But the reality for us that we have to wrestle with as I get ready to get close to closing here soon is, well, what does this look like for us? How do we get there? What could it actually look like if we sought God with literally everything that we have, knowing that in him we gain infinite wealth? What does it look like to be poor in spirit? And so just what I want to do really quick is just to go to a couple of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, in, in the Psalms, and just kind of look at what this looks like. And so in Psalm 42, verse 1, these are the words of David. And this is, just listen to these words. Just look, please just listen. He says, as a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Just listen to those words. And then in Psalm 63, 1, this is what it says as well. God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh, in some versions, it says my whole being faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And if you even go down a little bit in, in, in that same uh, chapter, verse 8, he says, my soul clings to your right hand upholds me. And so both of these texts that, that we're looking at are really just in the face of suffering and, and darkness and, and, and places uh, of agony and desolation. And in Psalm 42, he's just saying that his soul gasps for water like a deer who is thirsty and just holding on. If you look at this in relationship to, to Matthew 5, it almost haunts me to contemplate it. It makes me stare at the depths of my soul and literally just ask, am I thirsty? Am I truly needy? What would it take for me to just desire God with desperation, to be poor in my own spirit, where I am like this, this man in this verse where it's like, I will die if I don't get what I need. Like that deer who longs for water, knowing that being poor in spirit is what will actually make me wealthy. Think of it this way. When we humble ourselves before God, we get so much more than this world could actually offer. We get the kingdom of heaven. 
That's what the end of, uh, of, of Matthew 5, 3 says. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so does having Jesus sound like enough to satisfy us? Do we truly think that Jesus alone is enough to make us wealthy? That is all that we need. Or do we say deep down, no, I need everything else but Jesus, or I need everything else and Jesus to make it? What, what are we saying deep down? And to understand, it's just a little bit. This is what Charles Spurgeon says in relationship to these verses. This was, he says, till we are emptied of self, we cannot be filled with God. Stripping must rot upon us before we can be clothed with the righteousness, which is from above. Christ is never precious until we are poor in spirit. We must see our own wants before we can perceive his wealth. Pride blinds the eyes, and sincere humility must open them, or the beauties of Jesus will be forever hidden from us. And so I, I, I love this, this, this real quick, because one of the things he says is, really, Christ will never be precious until we are poor in spirit. What, what, what he's essentially saying is until we actually just see Jesus and our need for him, he will never seem precious to us. He will never seem precious to us. And as I think about that, I'm like, man, what am I not willing to go and give up for Jesus to pursue him in my poverty? But listen, in, in all of this, as you pursue Jesus, you have nothing to lose. You have nothing to lose, but you have the world to gain. Because listen, the end of that verse gives us so much hope. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. It's given to those who are poor in spirit. Think of it this way. You get Jesus for all of eternity. You get a new body <laughs> for all of eternity. And I know some of us got some broke bodies. My back hurting right now. Like, but this is what we get. You get joy. You get peace. You get patience. You get grace. You get mercy right now in Jesus. You get redemption and eternal blessing forever. You will never be separated from your father ever, not now or in the future. You will have an eternal family. You can have that here and right now. This is the kingdom of heaven. It is yours. This is the blessed life of those who are poor in spirit. You get confidence. You get freedom in Jesus. You get the Holy Spirit so that you can live and obey God right now. You get a spirit that literally seals you so nothing can rip you from the hands of Christ Jesus. You get comfort. You get hope for the new kingdom that is coming. And God wants to. He longs to give this to every last one of us. He does. We can obtain this. We really can by just saying, God, here I am. Nothing to offer. Literally just poor and needy with empty hands. No way to save myself. No amount of money can do it. No amount of good deeds. I just need you. God, I really just need you. And then if I don't have you, then death and sadness is all I can expect. And so before I get ready to pray and invite the band up, just know that this verse in Matthew 5, verse 3, it's just an invitation from Jesus. It's this invitation to come and just commune with him. It's an invitation to be rich in that which never fades away, in that which never perishes. It's to be rich in that which just is the sweetest thing that you could ever taste. Because you can lose physical health. You can lose riches on this planet and material. But Jesus, you will never lose. And he is just standing, knocking at the door as he says to the church in Revelation 3, the church that he was just frustrated at, this is what he says. Right after he says these things, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And so will we answer the door and just humble ourselves, approaching God with this poor in spirit heart, thirsty for him, being dependent upon God, knowing that in him are eternal riches and pleasures forever.